Hi, this is Sunil Gadse, and you're listening to Business Minds Coffee Chat with Jay Shear. Welcome. I'm Jay Shear with Jay Shear Business Consulting. We build solid foundations for service based businesses to grow and scale and achieve the results and success they deserve. And you've joined Business Minds Coffee Chat. We all experience that gut feeling or intuition from time to time. You, you know that feeling when you sense you should move towards or away from something. Do you rely on intuition when making decisions? Should you trust and rely on your intuition? Richard Branson has said that he relies far more on gut instinct than researching huge amounts of statistics. Well, get ready, because on this episode, we're going to explore the world of intuition with a leading expert. Our guest is a serial entrepreneur, business consultant, critically acclaimed author, a TEDx and sought after professional speaker, and subject matter expert on intuition. For over 25 years, he's taught hundreds of leaders and others how to trust their intuition to make better decisions that lead to greater success in all areas of life. He's been featured on TV, radio, a number of podcasts, and a plethora of prestigious print media outlets. Please welcome the author of Gut and Fail Fast, Succeed Faster, and the host of the Intuitionology podcast series, Sunil Godsey. Sunil, thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you. Absolutely, Jay. Thank you so much. Happy to share my knowledge, and I'm hoping that your listeners are going to pick up um, on trusting their intuition much, much better and sharpening it so that they make better decisions. Well, I know they will. And you and I have had an opportunity to have a conversation. We're part of a uh, a mastermind group together, and I've already learned from you, and I'm so excited about jumping into this conversation. So let's uh, let's get right to it. Absolutely. So I would love to hear about your journey and really what led you to the work that you do today. And as you share that with us, could you also share when you first discovered an interest in intuition? Absolutely. So, so the first time I got interested in intuition was actually right after I wrote my uh, first book, Fail Fast, Succeed Faster. And the premise between uh, on, for, for that book was that if I introduce stories of hurdles or failure from business executives and entrepreneurs, then the idea is that if you read these you and you didn't repeat them, then you should be able to succeed faster. I mean, that was the whole premise. So I, I wrote the book. And then when I started speaking on stages around the world, um, one of the biggest questions that I used to get or most common questions from entrepreneurs is, what's the one thing that I can do that's going to make me successful? And at that time, I kind of rolled my eyes saying, well, there's the, there's the reason why I interviewed 286 people for the book and only 75 stories made it because I had to keep it down under 500 pages. Um, but there isn't really one thing until I actually went back to the audio uh, podcast and started listening. And 80 to 90% of them use some form of language around, I knew what the right decision was, but uh, I ignored my intuition. I ignored my gut, some form of that. And I said, like, huh, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so then I started thinking, okay, well, when did I trust my intuition. And I really distinct, distinctly remember this. At five years old, there was these video games that my dad said that, uh, that I, I wanted. And my dad said, they're too expensive. And I remember so clearly, there was this voice that said, Sunil, that's not what you wanted to hear. You need to go door to door to raise money. So here I am, five years old. I've taken my two-year-old brother with me, tagging along. And we went door to door and we raised over $200 of which 100 went to my dad and the other 100 went to charity, which was my school was doing through, you know, so the UNICEF boxes and all that mm-hmm. and lots of milk and cookies. Uh, but that was my first sort of touch with intuition. But when I looked at the times that I ignored my intuition, three distinct uh, things had come up. The first was my career in engineering. So if you look at it, I'm South Asian. So there's only four things that you do as a South Asian, especially a son in the South Asian community. It's doctor, lawyer, engineer, or you're a failure. It's Mm. one of those four. And so I picked door number three and I became the engineer. My dad was an engineer 
and I hated it. Uh, you know, and two years into that three year stint, I ended up uh, becoming a private investor with Senior Frogs. It was the first Senior Frogs chain up in Canada, uh, and I was one of the member. I was part of the, the investor group that brought up. And it, within the first year, I was making five times more in dividends as I was part time hands off than I was as a full time engineer. So in the third year, I just said I'm quitting. Um, it sac- I had to sacrifice my uh, my relationship with my dad, uh, which was necessary, but that was necessary for me to trust my intuition. And that started me down the entrepreneurship route. Uh, and pretty soon I had a, a, there was a restaurant, there was a wholesale clothing, retail clothing, pop-up events, entertainment company. And uh, after seven or eight ventures, I amassed about 20 million in revenues before now moving on to management consulting. In the management consulting end, there was a really good opportunity in Silicon Valley uh, and I'm from Canada. And so with the exchange rate, it's like, you know, it's like finding gold. Uh, and there was a great uh, IT company, a big name that offered me a contract, but the contract terms kept changing. And my intuition at that time was saying, you better back off. But I was so emotionally invested in the amount of that contract. That's like, like, wow, this is, this is a lot of money that I spent every penny to go down there and they didn't pay me. And I came back to Canada with 25 cents in my bank account. I was about to be married in two years. I'm telling my wife, yeah, everything's great back in Canada. And and I I was like in my car and and like I didn't have a place to live. So, you know, that was devastating. And then perhaps the most devastating was I was doing some coaching while engineering and I had a friend reach out to me to try and get some advice. She was being stalked at the time. Uh, And she said, Sunil, I need some advice, advice immediately. And my intuition was saying, meet with her that afternoon. Uh, but for some reason, I, didn't, I wasn't that busy. I wasn't busy at all. I said, let's meet a couple of days later. And that mistake uh, was devastating because the very next day, that same guy followed her to a bus shelter and shot her in the head and killed her. Oh, wow. And I could have prevented that. And so when I look back at the times where I t- trusted my intuition and the times I ignored my intuition, I'm going like, Why? Why did I do that? And why was this something different every single time? And so it, it, that's when I said, okay, let's dive in and see, okay, is there any research behind this? Like, I mean, I get it. But pretty soon when I looked at the academic research, there were MRIs, there were brain scans. I was finding all this academic research on, on uh, intuition. And at the time when I was doing the research, a lot of it at that time, we're going to 2013, was all about, uh, you know, psychics, meditation, spirituality, cosmic coming from the cosmos. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. If that's what you think intuition is, that's absolutely fine. What I needed to do is, okay, let's see if there's something a little bit more tangible that people can gravitate to if I'm going to do anything with this. And sure enough, that's when the MRIs came up. And then what I, what I ended up finding out was that your intuition is really complex. It's actually made up of four different types. Um, and there's, there's things called signals, which we'll talk about, and there's four intuitive hurdles. Uh, but I found out that there were like four groups of people that, that really uh, I came across when it came to my research and intuition. The, fruit, the first group, absolutely, they, they get it. They absolutely understand it. They know it. They know their signals and they operate their life like that. Uh, the second group are kind of, you know, show me proof. Uh, and then I'll kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe uh, understand what intuition is. And so that was the whole premise behind gut, which is my the second book. But, okay, here's the proof. And here's a bunch of case studies showing these intuitive components in action. Hmm. The third group of people uh, are ones that uh, absolutely, you know, they kind of talk about it, uh, but they don't really understand it. So, and, I, and a friend of mine was kind of in that space uh, before I met him. He said, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I'm, I'm into mindset. I'm into, uh, you know, he's got all the lingo right. Um, it, you know, I'm into positivity. And then he met me and then he saw me at a, at a talk where I talked about the complexities of intuition. And he said, wow, you know, this is a lot deeper than I think. And it resonated with him, that definition. But perhaps the, the, the biggest um, definition that he got was he actually contracted covid he was in New York hospital in, uh, with COVID-19 and he was at a life or death moment mm. and he actually wanted to die. And his intuition, how I described it, came full circle and pulled him out to live. And for wow. him, he says, I now understand what intuition is. Sunil, you're bang on. Uh, and five days later, after he came out of the hospital, I was the very first person he talked to about this. Um, and he was the very first podcast guest 
for my podcast series. So there's no better way to start a podcast series than him being a guest. And finally, there's those that just don't believe. They, they, there's nothing called intuition. Uh, I don't believe it. Um, and so one of my first interviewees with my Intuitionology project was a gentleman by the name of John Rothschilds. At the time, he was chairman and CEO of Care Operations Limited. This guy was an investment banker. He says, yeah, you know what? I'll give you an hour, Sunil. You're my friend. I don't know what we're talking about. I don't believe in intuition. Uh, you know, we'll talk about intuition for five minutes and we'll have a latte, you know, for the rest of the time and catch up. I've been seeing you for a while. So for him, you know, we start the video uh, and he's just saying, yeah, you know, I wish I could see omens and get that. You know, I wish I could see the hand that does that. He's talking about business decisions. Others say, yeah, you know, I'm just not sure intuition plays into it. You know, it's just not about that. Uh, but what he didn't understand is that he bought, he thought, you know, his decisions were based on data and learning and experience. One of the four components of intuition is called experiential intuition. And it actually does look at your past learning and data. And in some cases, as I'm educating him on it, I, I said, well, sometimes you make a decision that goes against the data. That's your intuition. He goes, well, I have a story for you. And he talks about a story where he actually puts a franchise location where it's a five out of 10, which he would never do because he only puts franchise locations at a nine out of 10. He did it. It became the best uh, franchise opportunity under called the beer market under his, his, uh, his, uh, uh, his portfolio of restaurants. Okay. And at the very, very last part of the interview, an hour in, I said, okay, one of the four types is called creative intuition. That gets you to do decisions that are sometimes crazy. And I asked him, so was there a time where you made a crazy decision? Now he's fully in intuition. He's using the language. You can tell by his body language. He says, absolutely. I can tell you the story. And so this is a guy who is an investment banking, making three to four million a year, high-end restaurants, uh, limousines, private jets. And he's trading that all the way to run this tiny bankrupt little restaurant. Everybody thought he was crazy. I'm sure people are speed dialing a psychiatrist saying, I, I think I have a client for you. But he did. He quit, walked into that restaurant. That tiny bankrupt restaurant was Eastside Mario's location number one. And that became over a thousand locations over 20 years, $2 billion in revenues, wow. all because of an intuitive decision. That's Amazing. the power of intuition. I, I love that. I mean, you've, you, you've covered a lot of ground in that in that store, in those stores, and in that explanation, which which I just absolutely love. So, talking about the the, the different buckets that we fall into, uh, out of curiosity, you know, you told the story about six year old Sunil. At any stage in your career, leading up to where you are today. Did you fall into different buckets? Did you start in, in one bucket where you were maybe interested, maybe not a believer in intuition and then move to another bucket? Talk, talk about that progression, if you will. Yeah. So, so for me, I was always a believer in something was just telling me, like when I look back at the decisions that I made and the ones that where I had sort of entrepreneurial spirit in like even just being at bake sales or helping out here or doing something creative, there was always this something that led me to do that. And it was something that it was so enjoyable that it's always imprinted in my brain that that was really enjoyable. So there was this tie between something, but there was nothing formal about it. Uh, I just knew that if I went this way, it felt really good. And when I went the other way, it just didn't feel so good. And it ended up becoming either bad decisions or situations that I regretted. Hmm. So it was always this sort of binary thing. And so that was, again, okay, why is it binary? So why are some things good and why, why are some things bad? And why do some things feel differently when I make good decisions? And the same thing with bad decisions. And so when I looked at the research, it turns out that we all have signals and the way that it happens is these four intuitive, um, those types. And I mentioned experiential intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also mentioned creative intuition. The other two are situational intuition, which looks at the situation to see, okay, is this a safe environment? Can I walk in it or do I have to uh, move away? And the third one of the, of uh, the, the fourth of the four, and I'll mention all four is called relational intuition. So that's looking in the room to say, can I trust this person? Is the body language consistent or the actions matching the word? And it looks at, baseline. So if you're normally introverted or twitchy, or that's a baseline, what intuition is looking at is a detraction from that to see if that's deceptive or not. And can you trust that person? So in a split second, all these four types work together 
to help you with the decision. The way that intuition speaks to you are things through are called positive and negative signals. There's your binary decision. You have a basket of positive signals that are telling you what the right decision is. You have a basket of negative signals that are telling you what the wrong decision is. And each one of us are unique. So for me, it's like a, the dots connecting. So common ones are that, a flow, a pull. From the negative side, some of them are you know, a feeling of anxious or something's off. And some of the odd ones are seeing an orb. And I even had an entrepreneur tell me that his left earlobe get, got hot. And he actually, in the interview, said, I'm not so sure about signals. But when he starts telling about the ventures that he failed at, he starts grabbing his left earlobe. And then it hits him. He says, I think I just found a signal. And he now remembers when he got into those ventures, his left earlobe kept getting hot. And those are the ventures that either he made money or hated or he lost money on and lost time. So these were the, th- those the signals that I experienced. Uh, and so now being the engineer, uh, and if I'm going to write a book for the masses, you know, I, I got to see, well, yeah, it's great that it's spiritual and I, I sense it, but can I get something tangible? Because I'm kind of like, a, it's an art and a science, right? And so that's why it drove me to look at academic research and says, and then I said, yeah, that all makes sense. So now I've got the science backing what I'm saying. I've got the art, which is sort of your is signals that are unique to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it all depends upon what signal you're listening to. So you, let's say you get a voice. How do you know that that voice is signal number one or signal number three? Because you've ignored the subtle signals. If it's signal number one, you're lucky because now you know what the right decision is. If that signal number one is positive, you can go in that direction. If it's negative, don't. It's very simple. But it's, if it's signal number three, you've now made two bad decisions. And so those two bad decisions could be a stub toe or you could be headed towards bankruptcy. A lot to pay attention to, but this is Absolutely. happening rapidly. It is. And, and there, there is research that has shown uh, specifically uh, for entrepreneurs. And they measure things like skin conductance and heart rate. Mm-hmm. That intuition, uh, in, in the intuitive hit happens on average at that time, seven seconds before entrepreneurs actually made a business decision. No and this kidding. is very common to even personal life. Seven to 10 seconds was the research that looked at personal decisions and research that is coming out now. There's neuroscience research that hasn't been published yet, but the, the, the fundamental research is done um, where they looked at the amygdala and that's where the, the neurons hit first hit. And this is where your intuition is activated. They're saying that the, the difference between intuition hitting and making decisions up to 23 seconds. 23 seconds before wow. you actually make a decision. Your wow. intuition has told you what the right decision is. It's, it's, so what I'm doing with the Intuitionology Project is saying, okay, this is how your intuition functions. Educate yourself on that. Find out what your signals are and know them intimately by looking back at your good decisions and your bad decisions and get your inventory of signals. Because if you don't get it wrong, or if you don't get it right, sorry, uh, you could be headed down uh, the wrong path. And now you're wasting time making bad decisions And the other thing people don't realize is that cost of a bad decision is actually twice the cost. It's not just the cost of the bad decision that you make. It's also the cost of the opportunity that you you didn't make. And so a bad decision is twice the cost (laughs) of you making that bad decision. So it's an accelerating problem if you don't take the time to educate yourself on the components of intuition that work for you and your signals. Wow, amazing. And I want to dig a little bit further into the, sure. into the research here in just a moment. Uh, but two, two things I wanted to ask you about that, uh, that I don't want to forget. One is your, your friend who was in the hospital and you know, who was dealing with COVID, what, was the, what feeling did he describe to you? What was that intuitive uh, sense that he had and how did he describe it to you? So it was, he finally, it was just a a realization of knowing, of not wondering what people thought about driving his agenda. And he's in the education space and really helping bring education, uh, awareness of these kind of things, uh, mindset to the education space in New York specifically. Mm -hmm. And he's been driving in in the past, a lot of work has been done from him. But what he found is that he was ignoring his intuition. He didn't really mean what he said sometimes. He talked about it. So he internally knew that that was the, the, the drive he was doing, but he wasn't fully vested in there. The, the intuitive moment, it just opened up 
he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He knew what he needed to do. He didn't care about what people thought. It was like, it was like the field opened, the doors opened into this huge open field. And it was just, it just drove him. And it just seems like there were no barriers. He was not his own barrier. And that's what it felt like for him. And so when he did that, everything made sense. He changed the way he did things with the team, how he did, the, how he talked to the team. He knew where he was going to go. He got out of his own way. And that's what it felt like for him. Wow. Interesting. The other question that I had for you based on what you were sharing earlier was around your relationship with your father. So you decide to leave the world of engineering and you were pulled in a different direction, obviously didn't set well. Your father is an engineer. And now based on how far you've come and the type of research and the the impact that you've made, did, did you and your father bridge your relationship? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think he fully understands uh, what I do. Um, it, we're, we're closer than ever. Mm. Uh, and I remember this really pinnacle moment, and it was actually right after Fail Fast, Succeed Faster. Uh, and that was that time, sort of that was my entrepreneurship role and management consulting role and everything about business. Uh, and we were just in the mo- in mode of patching our relationship up. So it was still tense a bit. Um, and, um, uh, and I had done my MBA and all that stuff. So I think he was kind of proud that I did my MBA because it fit in the societal or South Asian norm. Uh, so he's, he's a bit proud there. And then, uh, you know, he came to, uh, I had a big conference here in London, Ontario, all on failure, learning from failure. I sold it out. Um, and he was one of the sponsors and he came and we were still kind of touch and go. And he didn't realize, he, he thought that I was a participant. He thought I was a speaker. So he didn't even know what he was sponsoring. He just said, yeah, okay, I'll sponsor, you know? And he's saying, yeah, my son's going to be a speaker. And he couldn't realize like, why is Sunil always like every speech he's up on stage introducing them like, wow, he's got a pretty prominent role as as a speaker. And he's at the head table. Oh, that's good. Sunil has some pull with the organizer. (laughs) He didn't realize that I was the organizer. (laughs) And the whole, it was, it was one of my, one of my good friends is also a very prominent Canadian business icon. He was there to support me. And he said, yeah, your son's doing some great things. It just never clicked. And then it was towards the end of the con- uh, the conference when we're sort of in the where the mode of we're, we're just talking and mingling. And one of my friends is uh, he's now retired as a police officer, uh, and he was talking to my dad. And he says, "Yeah, you know, he was, I was telling you, your son did a good thing. And your dad was, yeah, I'm proud. My son was a speaker." And he's saying, "Okay." okay. And then he said, "I was just talking to your dad, and and your dad just lost eye contact with me, and he's just looking around." And he said, "It just hit him. This is my son's conference." Wow. This, this is my son's car. And my branding was everywhere. Like the fail, fast, succeed branding. You couldn't go anywhere without my, my branding. And then he starts going to other groups. I'm Sunil's father. And he should, he's, this is my son's conference. That's Sunil over there talking with that group. He's my son, right? Love that. <laughs> That's fantastic. And, and it just hit him that... Um, you know, and it was so different from... You know, I have to also understand where he came from. Uh, you know... His intention was to put me in a nice, safe environment as a doctor, lawyer, engineer. Um, in the South Asian community, that's also nice to talk about. You know, you've got the ego. My son's a doctor. He's an engineer. He's a profession. So all of that sort of is was his intention. Uh, and there's not a lot of semblance whatsoever in the South Asian community about trusting your gut. And in fact, people, I think, misuse that term because they're trying to justify, you know, taking off into an area that, maybe they're just passionate about, but they can't make ends meet. And that's the one thing with intuition is it's a passion with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And those two have to match. And when you, when you act, when you match those two, and then you actually take the steps in your, in the present moment, trusting those signals to reach a goal, that's how you trust your intuition, not by, I want to have have a, you know, I want to affect 50,000 people with no purpose to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Having a big house, making lots of money. I mean, those could be nice laggard indicators, but you don't get there without taking the steps. And one of the best stories I can tell of this is I had a friend of mine who also um, interviewed David Damon's cerebral palsy, uh, and he's been in his wheelchair. And his dream was to dip his toe in the water in, in the ocean. So they wheeled his, uh, his handlers and his wife wheeled his, his ch- uh, chair, a wheelchair into the sand 
and he gets to dip his toe and he falls flat on his face, super embarrassed. And he said, at that moment, I had two choices to make. I can sit back on my wheelchair and for the rest of my life, regret not pursuing what I, was, I wanted to do, or I can trust my intuition and take that step forward. And he trusted his intuition and took another step and took another step and took another step. And then he says, and the water got up to about here and I'm, I'm pointing to my neckline. And then he looked back and he said, I didn't realize how far I came. And that's how intuition works. You take the steps and then you look back. You don't look forward and say, I'm going to do that because intuition helps you get there. And that's essentially how you have to do it with signals and uh, trusting those signals to move you forward. Mm, powerful. So let, let's dig a little deeper into the science for okay. a moment. So un- unpack a, a bit more about what you have, your, your own research, because you've, mm-hmm. you've had a lot of conversations, you've done a tremendous amount of research. And what have you come across? What are just a couple of points that you could make that would share some insights with our business community Mm -hmm. about the research around intuition used in the business environment. Absolutely. So one of the things that happens is when you're, you're, you're born with intuition. And so what happens is as you age, uh, there's over 90 billion neurons that move to hundred billion neurons and they're firing at about 200 times a second. And they're soaking in all the experiences around. So from a business business perspective or an entrepreneur perspective, uh, when you're going through some of the the, uh, trials and tribulations of of starting a venture or or even in some of the positions that you held uh, and the the experience of others, um, personal life aside, these are things that that you are actually going to put in the in the uh, subconscious area of your brain. And if you look at the brain like a an iceberg, 10% is the conscious part, which is above water, 90% is above water. So any business experience that you have, business decisions that you made, good or bad, all get put into the subconscious like a library. Uh, And so when you're making a decision at some point, maybe it's a marketing decision, a sales decision, uh, what idea am I going to start with? Do I have a target market? Uh, is, uh, Is my copy uh, right. You can get down to that level of decision and it'll pluck from the library of information, the inf- the experiences you've had of others have had that are relevant to that decision. And then once it gets that, that it's going to take a look at all the other three as well and combine it uh, together. So if there's no people, if there's no persons involved, then relational intuition doesn't factor. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're not dealing with a, a situation then situational intuition doesn't factor in. So it's really relevant. The four types are, they combine themselves based on the decision that you're making. And then that's when your neurons are firing. The amygdala is uh, is highlighted. There's some areas on the, on the top of the brain that are also highlighted when you're using your intuition. Uh, and then from there, from the amygdala, uh, remember it's going at uh, like 200 miles an hour. It goes to the frontal lobe, which is the rational part of the brain, data, experience, logic, right? So you're actually balancing emotion, uh, what you feel in the moment with some data and logic, uh, and then you make a decision uh, in, in business, right? And so in some cases, it may go against the data. Uh, like I told you with John Rothschild, this guy who's made you know, 30 years as, as with data and spreadsheets, that that's everything that rules his decisions, yet he still made decisions that went against his data, the data, because this feeling was telling him, to, again, to go against it. And that feeling is what you need to, to, to pay attention to. Um, when you hire, you know, you, you get a really good feeling of someone that, that you hire based on the questions you ask. So don't ask canned questions. Ask some questions where they really have to think about the answer and then watch their body language. There's your relational intuition, uh, right? Uh, are they being truthful? Are they making it up? You can tell, right? Because it, it, there's also research that shows that you trust someone within seven seconds, you're able to trust them. You're able to t- take wow. a body, you're, uh, you're able to sense a body twitch in less than a second, less than half a second, actually. How, so how is that? These, how is that measured? Is that with an fMRI, or how, how do we yes. how do we measure yeah. trust? A, a lot of it is so they they have some Likert style questions that where they measure trust, but they will look they will measure it also on sort of body signals. They'll use some cue cards. So there's different ways of of measuring this, mm-hmm. and then they kind of correlate that to trust based on the academic research and and how others have correlated that to trust. Uh, so if you believe that kind of research um, that's there, and you can always dive into it because um, I've got the uh, 
uh, I've got the uh, uh, citations for it. Um, but that's that's what they've come up with. Okay. Uh, and so they've mapped that to a lot of it's mapped to the brains because I really need for me, I need to see it where it's where it's happening in the brain. To me, that's a little bit more important than somebody answering some questions. So I spent more more heavily heavy research on for me on okay, does this happen in the brain? Um, rather than because it, sometimes if you if you answer questions, uh, some of these questions can pigeonhole you into answering a certain question. For example, what color do you like? Uh, and they'll give you, uh, you know, a range from, uh, let's say, off-white to black. But maybe it's the pure white that you you really like, right? And so what happens is now they're pitching you, holding you into, uh, you know, moving towards what they want, which I've seen. And so that's why when it comes to these types of research, I'm very careful in picking up on, okay, how do they measure it? Uh, and do I think, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, a doctorate uh, by any means, but do I think that there's credibility enough that I'm comfortable talking about it? Um, and brain scans, I think, are easy because these are people's brains, right? They light up, right? And uh, you're not, you know, I don't think you're playing the game because you're measuring a brain, right? And you can see these scans. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I approach the research in terms of validating in my, in, for me and for my book. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. That's uh, really interesting. And the the amygdala, amygdala, the amygdala, amygdala yeah. that's the oldest or older it part is, of yeah. our brain. Is that yeah, correct? That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's okay. so that's the primitive part of the brain, fight or flight, uh, where you feel like things happen. Simon Sinek also talks about that as well, and is in his very very famous TEDx talk. Uh, and that's uh, so that's where you feel like things are happening. He actually says that you feel like something's not not quite right, mm. but that's exactly where your intuition comes. So it's it's the first part of your brain that gets hit before anything else happens. Okay. Um, and then that's kind of also when we screwed up, right? <laughs> so interesting. So. You mentioned about experiences and past experiences. Yep. So they, those past experiences can both inform as well as impact our intuition, correct? Absolutely. They, okay. Absolutely. So they have a big part to play there. So what is, what's holding us back then from using our intuition and can we, can we cultivate it? And if we can, how do we cultivate our intuition? So intuition is always based on experiences, right? And so we're always cultivating it all the time. It, it, the first thing is, is are we going to listen to it? Uh, and so even if we have these signals that are telling us it's positive or negative, there's, there's four hurdles that we seem to get in, in trouble with that really squash the signals or limit our ability to move ahead. What, one of the biggest ones is fear. And so this is the fear of, of failure, fear of the unknown, fear of change. So from a business perspective, if you're pivoting into another product and it's, it's not as complementary or it is, but it's a new direction that you're taking your team, sometimes there's that fear that should I detract from what we're doing? Um, you know, and in your personal life, you know, uh, moving away from a really good relationship, um, you know, and going into the unknown, uh, maybe I don't want to take those steps. Um, and so that fear is, is a big one. The other, uh, the second of the four is called ego. And there's two types of ego. One is the narcissism where you're fully yourself. Um, and so you're talking, uh, you know, and, and you know that you don't have the experience or you're trying to just listen to your voice and others' intuitions, they get turned off, right? Because intuition is a two-way street. And so the intuition of others is just going to say, uh, this guy, is, you know, he's just full of himself or herself. Uh, the other side of ego is called uh, is is basically being part of a group, going with the herd. So in a business, is, let's say you have a business decision. Let's say let's take John's uh, thing. Maybe he wanted to do a five and a half out of ten. What does the rest of the management team say? Uh, are they going to think I'm crazy? What will the board say? Um, you know, I, I say nine out of tens. We have a great benchmarking tool, but now I'm saying five and a half out of ten. Maybe that's not so great. And so that's where that ego kind of comes in. And so even though his intuition is saying, open up the beer market, if he hadn't, that portfolio, which was the most profitable, wouldn't have ever hit the bottom line in terms of profits because he didn't trust his intuition. Yeah. Um, the other two are being too emotional. And so when you're really close to an employee, for example, uh, that's where emotions hit. In fact, there's one that uh, Rick Spencer uh, had Spencer Steel, a family owned business, uh, 29 years uh, at one point, 20 million in revenues, got really close to an employee. That employee was cooked the books. And within three weeks, there was an audit done 
and a 29-year-old company was bankrupt in three weeks because you got emotionally close to an employee. Mm. Uh, and then the other side is being too rational and you're trusting the data way too much. You go to what the data is. You just, you're, again, you, everybody's following the data. And so if, you know, if everything's saying, the data's saying go right, and if you don't go left, how do you crush the competition? How do you bring out a better product or service? Because you're just following everybody else. If you're like everybody else, then you're never going to be, you can rise to the top of anybody's decision set when you're looking to a product or service because you're just like everyone, right? So why would I choose you? I, I can't even see you. And so that's where trusting intuition helps to get into something that's unique or different uh, or what value do you provide, even your marketing message. You know, the marketing messages are a lot toned down. They have nothing to do with the people. When I buy from you as a product or service, I'm buying into th knowing that you provide a, a valuable service to me that's solving a problem that I'm willing to pay you for. And so if your marketing doesn't sp uh, speak to me in that way, uh, I, I just don't know about a product or service. I mean, you, you're, not, you're not fulfilling a problem for me. And so social media is ripe with this, right? Or empty promises, so you're promising me that you're gonna this this product or service is gonna have this kind of value and it's gonna solve my problem, but what I see is not what you're telling me. And if mm -hmm. it has this dichotomy here, my intuition is gonna say very quickly, I don't trust this product, I don't trust this company, I don't trust this brand. I'm gonna look somewhere else. And not only am I not gonna tell you that, I'm gonna tell my other friends, and they're not gonna tell you that either. And now you've just lost a you know, me plus three other people, plus who they, who do they tell? And now you're chunking off a part of the market and it comes back to opportunity cost. Because if you want to win back my business, not only do you have to pull me out of a, a value, a product or service that's already serving that need, you have to now convince me that your product or service is going to fulfill that need. And now you're back to our opportunity cost. It's two times the effort. And there's so much research on, uh, uh, you know, a new customer versus a returning customer. I mean, it's, it's six times less in marketing spend. Yeah, we, we see that happen all the time. And as you were, as you were kind of walking through the, those, those four areas that, that hold us back, I could see myself in it, it, at least one or all of those categories at some place or some point some situation throughout my life and throughout my career. I remember right. there was there was one particular time in my career, I was with a company for many, many years. And I actually stayed with that company longer than I should have. And I, I knew it, but I wasn't paying attention to it. And the reason that I wasn't paying attention to it, I was so emotionally attached because I had been with this company during its formative years and I was just so attached to the outcome. I was so attached to what we were doing day in, day out, but it just was not, had I been paying attention and listening to those intuitive signs, which I should have done, I more than likely would have left that company three to four years before I did. So it's really, it's really interesting. And I'm glad we're having this conversation and I'm glad that we are opening up this dialogue for others because it is important that we're that we are listening to that and that we're not just allowing it to have a feeling that come and goes without acting on it or at least pausing and asking ourselves what is this telling me why am i feeling this way and what should i do about it absolutely and and you know there's there's always listen when you get into business everything seems to be able to data processes uh, and it's very, very important to do that. But what comes before that is your intuition. I, I talked to an AI expert. I've talked to a copywriting expert. I've had a marketing expert, a branding expert uh, on my podcast series, and every, a scaling expert. Every single time, the common thing is you have to trust your intuition before any of that stuff falls into place because you could be doing the wrong process and it's just, it's so inefficient. Uh, and so your your intuition actually drives the decisions that's going to, create the efficiencies for the processes to work on. And the other misconception is that you need to have years of experience 
um, to do that. Or sometimes you're too old. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you got uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? 65 years old. Uh, Colonel Sanders almost bankrupt. He becomes a billionaire by 86. Hmm. Um, and uh, if you look at what my, if you see the art behind me, that's my 14 uh, year old who is running a nonprofit business based on intuition, on her passion. She's raised over $20,000 for those with disabilities and illnesses. And perhaps that's a business, right? She's, it's a federal incorporated nonprofit business. Um, and the pinnacle of what hits her, this is where value comes in, purpose, was she had this, this pop-up event and there was someone with cerebral palsy and his arm was just shaking. And then he says, I haven't painted in about 28 years, but let me show you what this is doing to me. And so he puts his, his, his brush to the canvas and his arm stops shaking. And he says, this is what your event is doing to me. And wow. it was so emotional for my, uh, my, my at that time, I was 13. That's purpose. Now, at the business, absolutely, right? She raised money to have that pop-up event. People bought her paintings. They bought her prints. She was sold out within the first hour of a three-hour fundraising event because people believed in her, the value she was bringing to others. And so she raised $20,000. Mm. There's the business. There's the tangible goal stick. But it was driven by an intuitive purpose uh, that people believed in. And that's where your products and services and the value you put out has to be. When people believe in what you're providing them, they will buy again and again, and they will tell other people. And now your costs all of a sudden are much lower by because you've, 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 you've actually had this intuitive two-way relationship with your customers. And that's the secret to crushing your competition because they yeah. aren't doing it. Love that. Wow. Good. Fantastic. So tell me, what are... What are one to two books that have significantly affected your outlook on life? Um, wow, because there's, there's so many of them that I've gone through. One is called Power Versus Force. Uh, and that's, uh, that's one that I've looked at. I'm just looking at it right now by um, David Hawkins. And so he gets into this thing with, uh, this is an older thing where frequencies and things like that. So if you open your mind to sort of frequencies and things like that, but he actually goes through experiments where, you know, you take a look at where you are uh, from an intuitive perspective is the way I look at it and how you, how you feel like how you carry yourself. If you're optimistic, if you're not, and there's some really interesting um, uh, experiments that they go uh, through there um, in terms of a second book, that's really tough because I get re I get inspired by a lot of uh, books. I, I, I guess um, Think and Grow Rich is a really, really good one about mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I had James Whitaker, um, as you know, one of my common uh, 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 colleagues on. And what I really liked about when I was in doing the research on this, and I read the original one, but it goes through those stories in my, uh, about intuition of how it has helped people, you know, become amazing at what they're doing because they trusted their gut. Uh, and that, I mean, that's the one that I pulled together. Uh, and that was something I asked James and he said, he, that's what he said. Absolutely. Like, you know, people call it mindset, positivity, um, uh, you know, being in the present moment. But a lot of that is your intuition driving that mindset, driving that positivity, driving uh, uh, that being in the present moment, because that's where it starts. It's almost the seed uh, and it's great that I get these stories that I can read from taking it back saying, here, yes, here's, there's some more evidence, uh, right? And it just adds to the evidence pool that I can just talk about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and you've got Richard Branson, you mentioned uh, there's uh, Tim Cook. Um, uh, you've got, uh, of, of course, uh, Steve, Jobs, Steve Jobs, Oprah, right. Right. Uh, Jeff Bezos has talked about intuition. Harry Potter, the whole Harry Potter series came to J.K. Rowling in a train. It just came. She wasn't even writing that. Um, you know, all these instances of these <laughs> influencers that we have that have intuition, but, or have used intuition, but you don't have to be an influencer. You just have to be you. Yeah. Excellent. And well said, and so true. So what areas do you want to move into next that push you to grow and reach your greatest potential? Um, so I'm trying to reach a lot more people. Uh, now, so I've actually shifted my business model. So because I got, I got inundated with one-on-ones, uh, and I just, uh, I, I, I can't, I, I just don't have the time with the balance with uh, my daughter Avni's uh, nonprofit, and my younger daughter now wants to do a business with together with her, where we're going to educate the youth, 
uh, on uh, aspects of intuition. So we've interviewed, we have an interview list. We've uh, interviewed a social media expert and scaling expert. They've got another 10 interviews to do. And we're going to do it like a Shark Tank style, but it's specifically derived at youth where they learn about confidence, purpose, passion, uh, helping others, um, public speaking. And those are very uh, formal words. The way that's going to be taught is going to be very informal. And it'll be sort of like a Shark Tank style. They have six months to grow a business, but it doesn't really matter about the business. It's, they've learned the underlying skills of how to, in my case, tap into their intuition using all these skills. So both my daughters are teaming on to do that. And so I got to find time for that. So I'm moving it down more to more of a membership model where I can have a lot more people come that way. And I've had 50,000 people stream through the Intuitionology Project now. Uh, and if there was to take it any further, um, one of the things I got fascinated with is the connection that people have. Um, and why is it that we can be halfway around the world and know when somebody fell into a pool or uh, know that someone, I haven't spoke to my dad in three months. These are actual interviews I've done, but I knew he had cancer. Um, Nick Bradley uh, saying that I knew my dog was shot. Uh, something had happened, even though he was on the phone with his mom said, no, nothing happened. It's, and these are at the, at, at these moments in time, uh, you know, had happened. So I'm fascinated by where the research is. There's some things mm -hmm. called mirror neurons that are now coming into, into play. And there's things about energy um, of, and how that imprints in the brain. And again, back to neuroscience. And if it's in the brain, it keeps that memory. And then so you can be anywhere in the world. And so you're connected intuitively to that person. Uh, and so then you feel like something's happened to them. Uh, and every single person I talk to has had that experience. So it's not coincidence. Uh, and so that's kind of driving me forward. My mom, my, my mom, my wife won't let me write another book. Um, so, she, uh, so I have to work on her intuitions, her, intu her intuitive signals are. Keep, keep working. Keep yes, working. Yes. It. Yeah. Her intuitive <laughs> signals is, is loud. It's a voice. No. Oh, <laughs> that's great. Oh, so. I love that. You know, it, it is incredible though, when you have that kind of feeling, when you sense that, uh, you know, someone's in either some sort of pain or yeah. there's a reason why you need to pick up the phone to call a relative or a friend that you haven't spoken with in a while. And you're not quite sure what it is, but something's telling you to do it. I mean, I know we've all had a, a similar feeling. The circumstances may be very different, but we've all had it before. So it's very relatable. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and these are things like you're not, you're not going to raise this white flag and say, hey, listen, I have intuition or I'm using my intuition. A lot of these things that you just know, you think, you, 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 you take a step back and you think, well, how come? Or, or you get into what I call intuitive mediums, like you go cycling or walking or you know, in the shower and you get these creative ideas uh, and, and it, it just happened, right? And so it's not, I, I mean, it's, I'm, it's, I'm just talking about it, but you don't need to, right? You, you just make a decision. And so I think that's what people need to be more comfortable with. And, and forget about what everybody else has to say about it, right? It's your, it's your journey. And if it happens to be the wrong decision, then you, you ignored a, a negative signal. So be familiar with that regular negative signal. And one of the things that some people think is that intuition leads you down the wrong path. But when I peel back the layers of that story, and I'll give you one very quickly, I had Mark Metry on my podcast series. He's, a, he's got Humans 2.0, uh, one of the top 100 uh, podcast series. And he had so he developed social anxiety. He was making some good money in high school, um, yet he felt that he needed to lie. And when we when I went through the interview with him, he was saying, uh, "Yeah, and but intuition sometimes is a negative, and it got me to lie so much. I developed social anxiety, and I want to take my own life." And I said, "But hold on, let's. I'd be happy to review the podcast series because before you started telling me that story, what did uh, what did you say? You said uh, I knew I shouldn't have." That's your intuition saying you shouldn't have. Then you proceeded with the story. And what he fell into was that fourth uh, intuitive, one of the four intuitive hurdles, ego. He lied to be part of a group. And he continued and he, it just, it went so far away from who he was that he didn't want to live. And thankfully, wow. obviously he did. So that's another misconception. This is where you have to pay attention to what the hurdles are or know the signals that are telling you. So that's how important it is. It, in some cases, it could be life or death. Amazing. So, Sunil, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, my legacy is really about telling as many people about what I've researched. And now I'm giving that to my kids. Uh, and my kids are able to help as many people 
as they are. And so what if I can get more people just tapping into this thing called intuition, and we're getting a lot more language about it, the, the, uh, um, uh, the research is just accelerating. The more people that can do that, the more people that can live their lives with purpose, then we have a wholesome world where you can really trust everybody. Everybody's doing things for the right things. They're not falling into extrinsic stuff. There's, there's no, I just see, there's no smokiness in when you walk in life. It's just clear and everyone, everything's clear around you. Uh, and I just wish everybody could, could be like that. Um, and I'm hoping my daughters continue doing that because they're such a young age and doing it, um, it with no purpose but to be happy. And what a way to live life. Amazing. That is so beautiful. And what great, what great examples to have your children follow that type of purpose-filled path. I love Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. So before I ask my final question to you, where can we connect and purchase your books and learn more about your amazing content? Absolutely. So you can purchase the books at sunilgatsi.com. There's intuitionology.com. But I would encourage people, to, don't even spend any money on me. The first thing you should do is go grab my free ebook off intuitionology.com. My free ebook goes to a seven-day challenge, which is also free. That takes you through the seven-step process I have where you actually identify a problem. In seven days, I show you how to use the components of your intuition to solve that problem. I actually measure your intuition there from start to finish, you actually get a percentage measure 100% of the time with over 54,000 people through there each and every single time by the seventh day, their intuition has strengthened. I've got case studies from two people who used it. The first one being someone who sold his home within those seven days, going from minus 20,000 to plus 50,000 a $70,000 intuitive decision. And the other case study is someone who was a victim or, or as a, a witness to a homicide, her boyfriend murders someone, a knife to her back, locked the door, said he's, he's victim. she's victim number two, choked, assaulted, asked to clean up the blood, um, escaped, thankfully, be, because of her intuition. And she used the seven-day challenge to figure out how to deal with her PTSD, depression, anxiety. It's not going to go away. But in the seven days, she realized so much about her on how to minimize that and how to start trusting people again. Mm. So if these are the type of people in seven days that can use their intuition to solve a problem, why can't you? And now you have a template to move every decision that you have in your life. And if you need anything further, it, uh, uh, the membership's there. But you've already got a template. So even if you don't want anything else to do or you don't want to hear anything from me and just consume my content, take the template. Every single time, you're going to make the right decision. And Perfect. so I'm all I'm, uh, intuitionology.com. I'm on all the socials, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram. I'm giving. I'm trying TikTok. No weird dances because I do want followers. Uh, so uh, there's those. I've got my Intuitionology podcast series. Um, we just released someone who was shot in the stomach twice. Um, her daughter was uh, doing 911, so that just got released today. Uh, previous to that, someone who was an astronaut that went up on the Space Shuttle Columbia, and how intuition drove that decisions. Hmm. So there's there, there's lots of ways to find me, and um, yeah, and there's Sunil at SunilGatsi.com. DM me, email me, happy to answer any questions. Outstanding. Well, we will obviously link to all of those in the show notes. So the big call to action that I'm hearing for all of our listeners and viewers is start by downloading that ebook. Absolutely. Get connected with Sunil. All right. So here's my final question to you. So what is what what's one piece of advice that you received that has had the greatest impact on you personally? The one piece of advice I had, and this was when um, I was looking to go down the, the medical route. Uh, and so I, I had my dad convince me and there was someone that, and this, uh, th that feeling in me was saying, I don't, I didn't want to do this. Uh, and there was a, a good friends of ours were cardiologists and the wife of the cardiologist uh, came up to me and said, Sunil, I hear you're, uh, you're thinking about going into medicine. And uh, she had a beautiful life uh, traveling everywhere and all that stuff. And, and she goes, do you want to have a family? I said, yeah, of course. Do you want to love your kids? Yeah. Do you want to be happy in life? Absolutely. Then don't go into medicine. Mm. Because you see everything here. It's just a facade. And I'm going to go in life being super unhappy you have the ability to change that. And that was, again, another piece of evidence of trusting my intuition because I knew 
I shouldn't have drunk the East Indian Kool-Aid and I kept grabbing the wrong glass. Wow. Great advice. Glad you listened. Yes. <laughs> Outstanding. Snell, I want to thank you so very much. I'm grateful for you. I'm glad that our our worlds have collided. Absolutely. And man, I'm just just so excited that we've had the opportunity to have this conversation and share this with everyone and to allow your greatness to show up and keep doing the amazing work that you're doing. I can't wait to continue to build this relationship and grow together and stay connected. So thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, Jay. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. And for all of you, thank you very much for watching. And, you know, please take a moment to subscribe and let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. And to enjoy more episodes and to learn how Jay Shear Business Consulting can build a solid foundation for your service based business, visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com. And until next time, keep learning and growing. Pay attention to your intuition. And we'll see you on the next Business Minds Coffee Chat. Take care.